Britain's jails are overflowing. More than 86,000 prisoners are currently incarcerated within their walls. For almost all of these prisoners, the aim is rehabilitation and release. But a tiny number are deemed so dangerous and depraved that they will never be freed. This extraordinary group of 47 men and one woman includes serial killers, torturers, hired assassins, and psychotic sadists. In some cases, the faces are familiar. Others are better known by the nicknames given to them by the press. But many of them you will never have heard of. This series will shine a light on the dark world of some of these killers. This is Mark Hobson, a deranged maniac guilty of a vicious killing spree. The girls were attacked with a hammer 17 times in the head, I think. All these are absolutely savage and brutal murders. He murdered four people over a week of madness. What made him flip in the way he did? He butchered a frail elderly couple. They were viciously attacked. It must have been horrible for them and lured a young girl to her death. Couldn't fathom to even think of what's in the mind of somebody who would carry out such horrific crimes. He was a drunken thug with an unpredictable urge to kill. Mark Hobson's uh, evil to the core. Yeah. And no one would know where or when he would strike next. For somebody to kill four times in cold blood like that has got to make him one of the most dangerous criminals in modern history in this country. The shadow of Britain's largest coal-fired power station is the North Yorkshire market town of Selby. It was here where Mark Hobson spent his youth. He had a stable upbringing and was never in any serious trouble. In his late teens, he was given a job by the local butcher Vincent Flavel. Well, he came for a job, you know, and uh, he seemed to be all right. And uh, when I set him on, he was very quiet. He was clean, tidy. He was so he was so good, quiet, you know. And but uh, they could you could tell there was something wrong, something wrong. You couldn't just put your finger on it at the time. But Vincent couldn't know how wrong things would become. And one day, after he'd been there a couple, two or three weeks, I heard a squabble going off in the back, and when I went in, his, they got a lad outside the fridge with a knife. And I thought it was just another argument, but I could see it was really serious. I kept saying, Mark, Mark, you know all right, put it down, just put it down, cock. It seemed to be frozen, you know, as if he couldn't hear me what I was talking about. And, and that lad of you were petrified. He was frightened to death. At that moment, Vincent knew his suspicions about this seemingly quiet teenager were right. You know, you can see it in their eyes. The eyes tell you everything. But by Joe, as soon as he got that knife out, he out, went out. I said, no, he'll have to go, cock. Hobson moved from job to job, working at the power station and local factories before getting a job as a dustbin man. But outside of work, his life was spiraling out of control. He started to drink heavily and fueled by alcohol, began to turn violent. When he left work, he used to go straight to the pub and start drinking and they'd be drinking nearly all night. Trevor Richards 
lived on the same street as Hobson and often used to see him out in the local pubs. Mark uh, changed when he'd been drinking, completely changed. He changed his um, attitude and everything. He used to fight anybody, you know what I mean? Really violent. It's um, one of them stupid things. What drink does he? But it wasn't just alcohol Hobson was abusing. His former friend, William Brace, witnessed him taking drugs too. As long as I've known of Mark Hobson, he's always smoked cannabis, taken speed. But he used to do it all day and all night till he went to sleep. It used to be a daily thing, really. Drink, smoke, drink, smoke. It's got a bit nastier and nastier, really, the more drunk he got. So how can drink and drugs change someone's personality so dramatically? Kerry Danes is a forensic psychologist. She studies criminals, how their crimes begin, and what makes them tick. The link between alcohol and violence is very well established. It acts as a disinhibitor and also it gives a person a very misplaced sense of being indestructible. Alcohol with drugs is a very potent mix and can cause violent reactions seemingly out of the blue. Mark Hobson doesn't need alcohol or drugs in order to be aggressive, so add them into the mix and he becomes quite a time bomb. People used to say it was, um, to stay away from him was nasty, sometimes evil. But he'd never pick on me because I was more his size. But that was about to change. During the afternoon of March the 22nd, 2002, Selby Town Centre was buzzing with shoppers. William was also in town and spotted Hobson out with his ex-girlfriend. I was walking down past the Golden Coffee Pot. I see Mark Hobson on this side of the road. He was with me ex-girlfriend. I walked over to him and um, he turned around and stabbed me. No other words were uttered. He stabbed me in the chest and as I fell to the floor, he stabbed me another three times in the arm, side of the chest and in the leg. This is a spot where I lay bleeding. Uh, it doesn't bring back very nice memories at all. Not only had Hobson stabbed his friend in broad daylight in front of dozens of people, he appeared to enjoy watching William fight for his life. When he stabbed me, I fell to the floor and he just stood there watching me really bleed. So, he looked evil after he'd done it. He didn't seem to care wasn't bothered. I think he liked what he'd done. Hobson was arrested and William was rushed to hospital in a critical condition. I remember cutting my jacket off and putting the chest drain in to drain all the blood and reinflate my lung. I think I was fighting for the life. Hobson was convicted of wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. But to William's horror, he escaped jail. Hobson wasn't seen as a threat to society, and he was sentenced to just 100 hours community service.
2003, Mark Hobson escaped a jail sentence for stabbing William Brace. He was getting on with a new life and found a new girlfriend called Claire Sanderson. They moved in together on a quiet cul-de-sac in the village of Campbellsforth. But this was far from an idyllic relationship. Neil Brook lived next door to the young couple. Him and Claire was, was very, very quiet uh, at first. Um, so they sort of kept themselves to themselves, really. And uh, over the weeks, they, they, used sort of, they used to have quite a lot of arguments. You can hear them sort of quite a lot of swearing and sort of really big slanging matches. And then probably 10 minutes later, they'd be walking up the road, arm in arm, like lovey dovey. Uh, so it was like, like, very like up and down relationship, I thought. Neil also noticed Hobson was a heavy drinker and was often out of control. Commotion outside, and we went to the door, the front door, and uh, Mark was still outside uh, punching his girlfriend. Claire was just stood there, and uh, she was um, getting punched by Mark. Mark was punching, her and uh, it was totally off his head. When he'd been drinking, totally different man. The argument was over before the police were called, but Mark Hobson was again showing his true colours, a violent drunk with an explosive temper. And then, on Sunday the 18th of July 2004, the cul-de-sac was shattered by a grisly and gruesome crime. I went to a, 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 lo a local market uh, early in the morning. I came back and there was sort of two police cars out, out outside, which um, looked I had a really funny feeling about it. And then uh, within about half an hour, there was probably about six, seven more police cars there. So I knew something was obviously ser very, very serious about it. Detectives have been called to a horrific scene. Two girls had been brutally murdered and their bodies were discovered in the bedroom of Hobson's flat. John Titley was North Yorkshire Police's on-call crime scene manager. In the main living room we went in, uh, there was a disturbed scene there. There were some blood splats on the wall and there was some uh, disturbance of the furniture, etc. But then upstairs we found the, the two girls. One had been wrapped in uh, black bin bags uh, and the other one was laid at the bottom of the bed, uh, naked, in what looked like a preparation for being bagged up as well. The first body was identified as Hobson's girlfriend, Claire Sanderson. The second was that of her twin sister, Diane. Both girls had been subjected to a savage attack. When we started to uh, get into the, the living area, there was a, a bed settee down there, and there was also uh, a sleeping bag type thing that had been placed over the top. Having taken off the sleeping bag, we found a lot of blood uh, there was a lot of uh, impressions on the, the wall where there'd been some, like a hammer mark. And then when we started to pull it further back, we found a hammer under the, under the bed. The sisters had been struck over the head several times with a hammer. Hobson's girlfriend, Claire, was found wrapped in black bin bags. 
Her sister Diane was lying next to her. She was upstairs in the bedroom, laying on the bottom of the bed, uh, on a clear plastic sheet. Looks as though she was going to be um, wrapped up, um, similar to her sister. Um, she'd received quite considerable uh, injuries. She had a um, carrier bag wrapped around her head, and she had um, some strangulation marks, and, and quite a lot of bruising around her body. This crime scene really had all the tra traits of, of being a, a prolonged and, and vicious attack. I was absolutely gobsmacked, really, because obviously you don't expect that to happen um, next door to you. It's shocking, and all the neighbours couldn't believe it as well. You think this still happens. My mobile phone rang and the control room were telling me that they'd got a crime scene with two dead bodies. So I said, yes, well, I'm already here, you know, we're going to start the examination. Uh, then about five minutes later, my phone went again and uh, I was told that we've got a crime scene with two dead bodies. I said, yes, I'm already here. They said, no, we've got a second one. The news was unimaginable and horrific. There had been another double murder some 20 miles away from the Selby crime scene. This was just too much of a coincidence. Police believed they had to be linked. This doesn't happen in North Yorkshire. Uh, it's not the sort of county where we get these double murders. So until we could prove otherwise, uh, we would treat these as linked offences. This time the victims were not young, but a frail elderly couple. 80-year-old James Britton and his 81-year-old wife Joan had been subjected to a vicious attack, just like the girls in Selby. Tony Jefferson was the crime scene manager dispatched to investigate. When I went into the house, um, I saw Mrs Britton, who was laid in the hall. Um, there was the broken handle of a knife laid on the floor and we subsequently found that the blade of the knife was still in her body. From there, across the hall into the living room where we found Mr Britton, who was laid in front of the sofa. There was a, a walking stick there which we assumed and they'd found to be uh, the victim's walking stick. Uh, it was considerably bloodstained, uh, so we assumed that he'd been bludgeoned with that walking stick. It was a very vicious stack, yeah. Um. Four people had been brutally murdered and discovered just hours apart. Shockwaves echoed across the county and journalists like Mike Laycock were stunned to find that this quiet Sunday morning had become the most terrifying weekend in living memory. To get one murder in a year is perhaps what you might expect at most. To have four in one weekend, it was just unbelievable. Um, and immediately it became a, a big national story. So by the time we brought, came out the next day, uh, it, it was all over the national front pages as well. Um, and North Yorkshire really was under siege from, from the police, from the media, and uh, it became a really, really serious situation. It seemed likely that Hobson had killed all four people but the police needed proof. Hobson's flat would clearly be littered with his own fingerprints. So the main task was to try and find unusual prints that would suggest he had murdered the girls. 
with the uh, bodies being found upstairs, uh, and our suspicions were that they'd been murdered downstairs, he obviously had to get them up there. Uh, so one of the examinations we carried out was to look at the banister and we found that there were grab marks, finger marks on the bottom of the spindles which turned out to be Hobson's and that isn't a place you would find fingerprints uh, and in our opinion those marks had been left where he'd been holding on to the banister to pull the bodies upstairs so that really was a significant find for us. Detectives also found Hobson's prints on the bag used to wrap up Claire's body evidence suggesting he was the killer. But what of the elderly couple in York? If forensics found Hobson's prints there, it would prove he had been in the house. And their searches paid dividends. On the door between the kitchen and the hall, uh, where Mrs Britton was lying, uh, we found the fingerprints there, and on a number of shoeboxes that had been taken out of the bottom of the wardrobe in the back bedroom. We got a, a phone call from the fingerprint bureau saying that um, it had been a definite match. That was a, a very nice moment, I have to say. Detectives were now convinced Mark Hobson had murdered all four people in a vicious and brutal killing spree. But now he had gone to ground, and everyone was terrified that this might just be the start of his deadly rampage. The main concern was that this man had still not been found by the police, and he was at large, and he could kill again. In the summer of 2004, North Yorkshire was in a state of shock. Four people had been murdered in what appeared to be a vicious killing spree. Police believed a known thug called Mark Hobson had brutally killed two sisters in Selby before heading up to York and killing again. But now he was a fugitive and they needed the public's help to find him. They released his name and picture to the waiting journalists, hoping someone would know where he was. There's a packed press conference held on the Tuesday, which was about 48 hours after the story broke, um, in which they, the police revealed that the two murders were linked and that they were looking for one particular person in relation to this, Mark Hobson. Um, they said then that forces across the country had been alerted um, and nobody knew where he was. The police don't release pictures of fugitives lightly. They, they release them in the hope that somebody will see them. But for police to be able to say right from the word go, this is the man, this is the man we want, he's highly dangerous, don't approach him, but we need all the help we can possibly get from you to, to identify him. You would, you would recognise him um, when you met him, having seen the picture repeatedly. He's got a scar on his face, he's shaven head. Um, he looked a bit monstrous. He looked like a bit of a monster, really. The pressure to catch Hobson before he killed again was immense. So the police couldn't just rely on this publicity campaign. Experts were drafted in from the National Crime Faculty, an organisation that helps forces solve Britain's most serious crimes. I think at the time uh, the main concern was that this man was still, had still not been found by the police and he was at large and he could kill again. Shirley Penman was given the job of coordinating psychologists, search teams and geographical profilers in a bid to catch the killer. Part of the, the manhunt was to look at Hobson's past. Where did he have any connections with? Had he been to any other cities? Where, where was he born? So we had to find a lot about his past to be able to try and locate where he might have been. We did believe that he didn't have any kind of strong connections with anywhere else. He probably felt safer 
in the area where he was used to. So I think to all intents and purposes that uh, Mark Hobson hadn't gone very far. Armed with this new intelligence, police flooded the county, launching the biggest manhunt of recent times. All the police died coming around, you know what I mean? And looking in empty flats and they were near us, kicking door in, going into other people's houses looking for him. Well, the police saw somebody was harboring him, but in Selby. One person who the police called on was William Brace, an old friend of Hobson's who'd had first-hand experience of his violent temper. I'd seen it on the TV news earlier, and um, I got a visit from the police. They told me what had happened. Obviously, I hadn't seen him. Um, I didn't know where he was hiding or where he would hide. He'd shown me a few pictures. What he did to the girls was disgusting, and I've never heard anything like it in my life. Police were warning the public that Hobson could still be in the York area. The news struck fear amongst the locals in the village where he'd killed the elderly couple at random. Everyone was terrified the murderer might strike again, and the church soon became a safe haven for frightened villagers. There was a, a very palpable concern amongst people that uh, they needed to look after their children, look after the elderly. Uh, quite a few people were wanting to come into church and to spend time in quiet here to reflect about what was happening. But it was good to see people um, pulling together, looking after each other, arranging to go around to, to keep an eye on neighbours, and also to, to be questioning what was going on here, you know, that, that somebody's life had been taken away, and, um, and what that meant, the seriousness of it all. This unpredictable killer had to be caught before more lives were lost. It was vital that the police understood his crimes and the motivations behind them. At the first murder scene, horrific details were beginning to emerge. There's no doubt at all these are absolutely savage and brutal uh, murders. Um, the, the, the girls were uh, attacked they, uh, with a hammer 17 times in the head, I think uh, Claire was. Um, and uh, her sister, Diane, was uh, uh, sexually assaulted in a horrific way and suffocated. What he did to um, those girls was beyond belief. He didn't just kill them. He did all sorts of appalling things to, to their bodies. And for somebody to have done that makes them very, very dangerous indeed. But there was another deeply sinister twist to these murders. Though police believed Diane had been murdered recently, a post-mortem revealed a shocking secret. Hobson's girlfriend, Claire, had been dead for a week. And he had been living with her dead body the whole time. To live in a house with two bodies in it, particularly where the um, bodies have been murdered in the front room and you're living in that front room, and there's still evidence in there that shows um, blood on the wall and on the settee, to be living in there with a decomposing body as well, I mean, the smell in the house, um, you've got to be some sort of um, sad individual. Police were quickly building a profile of a cruel, callous killer, and then they made another chilling discovery, which proved these murders formed part of a sick and premeditated plan. On the back of an old bus timetable, Hobson had written a shopping list for his murder. On it were items that would help him dispose of dead bodies. He's meticulous in his planning. He's spent a lot of time thinking about how he's going to deal with the problem of these two bodies. And he's thought about things that would be unthinkable to other people. 
He was planning to buy fly spray, so he was obviously planning to have the bodies in his possession for quite an amount of time. But Hobson hadn't just planned how to dispose of the bodies. He had planned murder too. Witnesses told detectives that Hobson had phoned Diane, asking her to come to the flat because Claire was sick. But the truth was, he'd already killed Claire, and this was a deadly trap. He killed one sister, and her body was left in the flat for a week before he lured her sister, twin sister to the flat and murdered her as well. Um, so there's clear in indications of premeditation. It wasn't um, a spur of the moment offence. Police were building a clear picture of what had happened in Selby. And as they continued their investigation, they were able to retrace Hobson's steps after he had fled the scene. He'd contacted his, his mother after the murder of Diane. And first of all, he wanted to borrow the car. I think that um, his mother had suggested that he, sh he didn't need to borrow the car and that she would give him a lift to wherever he wanted to go. And he told his mum that uh, Claire and Diane were in hospital and he wanted to be dropped off in York Hospital. CCTV confirmed this report. Hobson is seen walking through the main doors of the hospital just hours after killing his second victim and while on his way to a third murder. The victims were a much-loved elderly couple murdered in their own home. Prints on shoeboxes suggested Hobson had broken in and was searching for valuables. I think he was looking for money. Um, I think he'd gone straight to the, uh, to the wardrobe, hoping he'd find something in there. But a frail old couple wouldn't have put up any resistance. <coughs> Hobson didn't have to kill them. They were just normal people going about their normal evening business. Mrs Britton was making hot chocolate for them and the bowl was there with the chocolate. And uh, they, were vi they were viciously attacked. It must have been horrible for them. The trail of destruction Hobson left behind was horrendous. But what baffled everyone was that there was no pattern to his behavior. This was an incredibly complex killer whose actions were impossible to predict. We're actually dealing with three different types of murder. Um, one which could be domestic-related, domestic the second which could be a sexual uh, predatory-type murder, and the third, the, the murders of uh, Mr and Mrs Britton, which is uh, opportunist and seems to be motiveless. Uh, this made this case even more complicated and, and very, very unusual. Although police had learnt a lot about Hobson's past, his behaviour was so erratic and unpredictable, they had no idea where he would go or what he would do next. Detectives were at a loss, but then on day eight of the manhunt, this sadistic killer would finally reveal himself. And he walked into the place, and as soon as I saw him, I recognised him and rang the police immediately because I knew who it was. We wanted to do all we could to assist the police in catching this man. And eight days into the manhunt, 
their hopes would be realized at this isolated garage. A garage 15 miles away from the second murder scene that was run by pensioner Derek North. There'd been photos of him, or paintings of him on the police vans. It was in the Yorkshire Post, the Evening Press, everything. And I'd seen those, and as soon as I saw him, I recognised him. The most wanted man in Britain had casually strolled into the garage shop. Derek was in no doubt that this was the man who everyone was talking about. And he walked into the place and uh, asked for sig papers, a uh, bottle of water and some matches. And as uh, soon as I'd given him his change, he walked out and he started to run and look backwards. And I watched him and rang the police immediately because I knew who it was. Hobson fled and jumped over the fence into the neighbouring fields. He ran over to the field across there. He was hiding in the corn in the field. Armed police officers rushed to the scene, alongside dozens of dog handlers. I thought, we've got him. Within minutes, Hobson was arrested. His clothes still covered in the blood of his victims. The biggest manhunt of recent years had finally come to an end. I got a phone call saying that he'd been caught at, uh, at Shipton. I think everybody was delighted. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not somebody you want out on the streets, is it? There was a palpable sigh of relief, <laughs> I think, uh, amongst people. Uh, he was caught on the, um, the Sunday, and uh, the news came through pretty quickly. And on the Monday morning, I remember the vicarish friend was, was very busy, uh, people ringing up uh, just saying that they were so pleased that he'd been caught and um, that at last they could get back to normality. Thanks to the quick-witted actions of one pensioner who spotted the face of a fugitive, a dangerous killer was now in custody. Well, I was delighted we'd done some good because he'd done so much damage to people. Now it was time for the police to try and find out what had been going through Hobson's mind when he committed those four murders. Gary Shaw is the UK's national interview advisor. He was drafted in to oversee the questioning of Hobson and had been preparing his plan before Hobson was even caught. Nobody would know when he first came in the door what he would see here. So it's about making sure you have all the material ready, you know, what crime scene photographs are you going to be using, what forensic reports were coming in, how are you going to use that in the interview process. As I say, because you never know what he's going to say when he came in. But you've got to be ready because you've only got a limited amount of detention time. But detectives would have to be patient. A week before, Hobson was a violent and vicious killer. Now... He could hardly stand. Normally he would be brought straight to the police station, but I think what happened was he was taken straight to the hospital because he, he'd been in the woods uh, hiding and he'd sort of dehydration, I think. So initially I think he went to the hospital. The picture of him when he, when he uh, the merge of him when he was captured by the police was quite extraordinary. He looked so dishevelled, exhausted, dehydrated. Very different from the image that had been circulating during the week. Hobson was, was in a state of um, very, very shaking and it seemed as if the, the reality of, of everything had, had actually come to him. I 
I remember distinctly, you know, one of the interviews uh, all the way through, he was just shaking, I remember having a glass of water and just shaking constantly all the time. All, all of the time. And I've, you know, I've been involved with hundreds of moderative interviews over the years and I, you know, I've seen people shake at various points, but he was just shaking constantly all the way through. But detectives needed answers. They had already recovered overwhelming forensic evidence from both scenes that appeared to prove Hobson's guilt. The time had come to present this evidence to their suspect. When we asked him to, to talk through the, the events, he remembered the end of the first murder. I remember him seeing he, he come to in the bathroom and he had a hammer in his hand. When he was actually shown some of the photographs, he did identify uh, a weapon which had been used to uh, kill Claire. Hobson could only remember the briefest details and appeared to be suffering some form of amnesia. He did talk about the prelude to the second murder, how he'd uh, sent the message to the to his partner's sister that she was sick and poorly in the house and she'd asked to see her. So there was a degree of planning that he talked about in relation to her, but then had no recollection of the actual event itself. The events after that were all a blur to him. Everything was a blur to him. He had no recollection at all of the, of the final, the, the, with Mr. Mrs. Britton, of the, event, of the incident. None at all. That, that's what he was saying. It isn't unusual for criminals to suffer from selective memory when they're trying to avoid taking responsibility for things. Saying that, murder is traumatic for the killer as well, and people deal with extreme events by trying to block out horrendous detail. It's possible, I suppose, with also the additional factor of drugs and alcohol, that he genuinely couldn't remember aspects of his offending. And it, it was all the words were stuck in his throat. I think he needed that. He needed it to say they accept responsibility because so he wasn't denying it, but he, he just was coming. At court, Hobson pleaded guilty to all four murders. He was jailed for life and told he will never be released. I, I agree with the sentence, Ut ut utterly. He murdered four people and he should never be released, ever. If he got locked up for uh, stabbing me, he never would have murdered them four people. Mark Hobson's uh, evil the call. Yeah. But even though Hobson pleaded guilty, he has never revealed why. He has never given any explanation of what drove him to brutally kill four innocent victims over that week of horror in July 2004. Mark Hobson had been triggered in some way to carry out horrific crimes and we don't know what that trigger was. And I don't know whether we ever will find out what the trigger was. People can't help it but, uh, but speculate for, for reasons. But the only person who would know what the motivational was would be him, e even if he knew that himself. 
For somebody to kill four times in cold blood like that has got to make him one of the most dangerous criminals in modern history in this country.